With a lot of money that's going in into developing universal gate quantum computers and the amount of progress that we've made in the last few years, we're kind of thinking, how will that actually change how we secure everything that we do online? Shor's algorithm is the killer app for quantum computing because it could potentially destroy cryptography. Two of the most common crypto systems online are RSA cryptography and elliptic curve cryptography, or ECC. However, the problem is that both of these are really vulnerable to attacks by quantum computers. And so a large enough quantum computer will be a problem for you or anyone interacting online, so pretty much most of us. But having a large enough quantum computer to do this algorithm is still many years away, hopefully. Some scientists do argue that a quantum computer large enough to run Shor's algorithm will never be built because it takes millions and millions of qubits. You may have seen some studies that show it takes about 4,000 qubits to break RSA encryption and about 2,500 to break elliptic curve. However, these are logical qubits and not physical qubits. Logical qubits also need additional qubits for supporting error correction and other processes. So in the end, the number is millions or more. But a lot of other scientists believe that we will eventually get there and we need to start preparing for the post-quantum future. So how do we actually secure future systems against quantum computing? One of the ways is post-quantum cryptography, which is a new set of classical encryption algorithms. And the other is quantum cryptography, which actually harnesses the power of quantum mechanics to make data secure. Both may have their place in the future of secure communication, but they're very different and each have their pros and cons. First, let's talk about post-quantum cryptography. Post-quantum cryptography is classical cryptography that stands up to the attacks of a large quantum computer. It does not use any quantum properties and it does not need any specialized quantum hardware. It's based on hard mathematical problems like the cryptography we have today. For example, RSA encryption is based on the difficulty of finding two prime factors of a number, but multiplying these two numbers together is super easy. Post-quantum cryptography avoids using discrete log problems or integer factorization problems to encrypt data. We already know these problems are super vulnerable to quantum computing attacks. An RSA key that would take millions or billions of years to solve on a classical computer could be broken in seconds or minutes by a quantum computer, and that's pretty scary. And unfortunately, doubling the key size at this scale doesn't really do anything because quantum computers do not just brute force a solution to this problem. And just a side note here, if you learn anything from me, and I mean anything in my entire YouTube channel or anything I do, it's this one thing. Quantum computers do not work by trying every possibility at once. I don't care if you absorb nothing else from my videos. If that were actually true, then a quantum computer would actually be faster for every problem in the world and be faster than a classical computer. But that's not true. There's 50 or so quantum algorithms that are faster for specific problems. So please remember that, it's really important. So all of these post-quantum cryptography algorithms would not need that special quantum hardware to encrypt data. They base that encryption on new mathematical problems that are not vulnerable to quantum computing attacks. And of course, they also have to stand up to classical computers and supercomputers as well. The government and NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has been really worried about this possibility for a while. Even as early as 2013, there have been talks about moving away from these sweet B cryptography ciphers and moving to something more quantum secure. So in late 2016, NIST ran a competition for post-quantum cryptography standardization to find new suitable quantum resistant public key encryption algorithms. This competition will set the standard for quantum resistant algorithms, each for digital signatures, public key encryption, and the generation of cryptographic keys. They revealed 26 algorithms that went on to the semifinals. So what properties does a winning algorithm need to have? Number one, it must stand up to quantum computing attacks, obviously, and classical computing attacks. Number two, it must be fast because we can't slow down communication. The world depends on it. This encryption needs to run on the web, on smartphones, on sensors, and other devices with limited compute power. A very slow algorithm could hamper communication. So another common encryption algorithm is AES. It's not as vulnerable to quantum computers as RSA and ECC are. We could double the key size and get them up to full strength, but that would still significantly slow down communication. More details about the 26 candidate algorithms are published in the NIST internal report. The 26 algorithms had very different approaches, but mostly lay in three families, lattice-based, error-correcting code-based, and multivariate-based cryptosystems. Lattice-based cryptosystems actually have a very large body of work behind them, starting back in 1996, and are thought of one of the best candidates for this new standard. How does a lattice-based cryptosystem work? 
this lattice is just a grid of points. So you're familiar with a graph with two dimensions with the xy axis or three dimensions xyz. But this grid can actually extend to many more dimensions, for example, four dimensions or 10 or hundreds or even thousands. There are a lot of potential problems that become more and more difficult as we add more dimensions. For example, the closest vector problem or the bounded distance problem or the covering radius problem. So for example, for these lattice-based crypto systems, we use a lattice with many thousands of dimensions and the goal is to find two vectors that are close together. That's totally easy in two dimensions, right? You just find the two and connect how close they are and that's super easy. But once you get to thousands of dimensions, that problem becomes really hard to solve. Currently, there are no efficient algorithms, whether classical or quantum, that can solve this in less than exponential time. In July 2020, the selection criteria began. From the 26 algorithms after a public review, we found a few just didn't work out, so now there's 15 algorithms left. These 15 algorithms that were left were mostly in the families that were already mentioned, the lattice space, the error correcting code, and the multivariate problems. And this does think that they'll eventually recommend multiple standards of encryption just in case someone managed to break one down the road. After that, we have to begin the process of actually upgrading all these computer systems worldwide to use these new encryption algorithms. In a world where a large quantum computer exists, we need to upgrade pretty much everything being sent online, and that's a lot of change. Luckily, as soon as we upgrade these systems, all the communication going forward will be protected. But this is really expensive, and it will take a lot of time. Previously, it's taken almost 20 years to move from the idea to full implementation and use of these new encryption algorithms. This includes doing the research on these algorithms themselves and building the software layer and upgrading all the hardware. And I mean, some people think that NSA is already collecting data to be encrypted further down the line when they actually have a quantum computer. And for some information, that's totally not a big deal. If I send a message about where I'm gonna be tomorrow, well, you could save it and decrypt it in 20 years, but that's not information that's really gonna be useful to you in 20 years. There's some long-term information that could be captured now and actually have an impact in 20, 30, 50 years. I imagine this is kind of how serial killers felt when DNA technology came out because they didn't think that a drop of blood or some of their hair would actually be useful to the police even in 20 years. And now we also have to do research and do risk analysis on quantum computers that haven't been built yet. Maybe we discover new quantum algorithms or maybe we discover a whole new computing system. And that would mean we have to discover new encryption standards again. But if we wait to find a new quantum safe encryption standard by the time we get large enough quantum computers, that will be entirely too late. So now let's talk about quantum cryptography and how that's different. Quantum cryptography actually uses quantum mechanical principles as a basis of securing data. And because these systems use the law of physics instead of mathematical problems, they are theoretically unbreakable because the laws of physics are physical laws that we can't break. Of course, this unbreakability does not apply to side channel attacks, which are attacks on the implementation instead of the actual encryption. Quantum key distribution or QKD uses these quantum mechanical principles to create a shared key and distribute it, all while being certain that a third party has not eavesdropped. For quantum states, we have several properties of nature that makes this eavesdropping really hard. Quantum states exist in a superposition of zero and one, which means there's a probability of the state when measured of collapsing into zero and another probability of it collapsing into one. So these states collapse when they're measured and you can never get them back. So it's not like a bit where you can read it out how many times you want. If an attacker tried to read out information in this quantum information-based protocol, the quantum states would collapse and no longer be in a superposition. Additionally, the no cloning theorem in quantum states means it's impossible to copy a quantum state. So the attacker couldn't just copy the quantum states over and do operations on their own copy. So if someone tries to eavesdrop, Alice and Bob will know. So it's based on the laws of physics and not our understanding of mathematics and hard problems. This means it will remain secure no matter how big classical computers or quantum computers get. Long distance communication uses these quantum properties. BB84 and E91 are the most famous communication protocols for quantum key exchange. These protocols generate a shared secure key that can be used to encrypt messages. Let's go through the BB84 quantum key exchange protocol and go through all the steps together. Number one, Alice prepares a bit string she wants to send and randomly selects a polarization basis. Physically, we can think of these bits being encoded in photons and the polarization of the photon is the state. She can either select a horizontal vertical polarization basis where horizontal is a zero state and vertical is the one, or she can select a diagonal polarization basis with a downward angled basis being a one state and the upward for the zero state. Number two, Alice prepares a sequence of photons and chooses the polarization. For example, Alice selects a bit string 0, 1 and chooses a horizontal vertical polarization. Then the first photon she sends will be horizontally polarized and the second will be vertically polarized. Number three, Bob chooses whether to measure in the diagonal basis or the horizontal vertical basis. 
However, this means he loses information when he randomly chooses the wrong basis. If he chooses to measure a diagonal polarized photon with a horizontal and vertical detector, he gets a random answer and destroys their original polarization. If he chooses the correct basis, we'll be sure that the readout result is the correct one. We detect and record the results for the entire bit string. Practically, this can be imagined by a polarizing filter, like in fancy sunglasses. It works by only letting through photons of the correct polarization. The lack of a photon means that the polarizing filter blocked it from transmitting. Number four. Alice and Bob publicly compare their encoding basis. Using this chart, Alice says that for photon 1, I use the horizontal basis. If Bob used the diagonal basis to read this out, the result he got was random. They discard that bit in the sequence. They keep only the bits when the basis they prepared the photon in and the measurement bases match. The shared key is the remaining sequence. Eve can come in and listen to these photons if she wants to, but she's in the same position as Bob to choose the random basis. However, as soon as Eve interferes with the photons, the states collapse, introducing additional error into the measurement. Alice and Bob can check for errors by choosing a subset of the key and publicly comparing it. If there are more errors than we expect, for example losses in the channel or measurement errors, they discard the whole key. And that's how we generate a provably secure key. Now you may say, wow, this sounds great. It's super secure, provably secure. Why don't we always use quantum cryptography? The problem is quantum cryptography requires specialized equipment. For example, you need photon detectors and beam splitters and other equipment to make this work. So we can't put it into a small device like your phone. How would you fit a beam splitter into here? Also, just because the key is provably secure and created by the laws of nature does not mean that no attacks can ever occur. Even without quantum computing, intrusion does occur on current classical encryption algorithms. And it's not because someone can now randomly break RSA or elliptic curve encryption. It happens usually because of weaknesses in the implementation of the whole system and not the actual encryption algorithm. So even though we can be sure that nobody has actually intercepted these photons in the way of creating the shared encryption key, there are other attacks that can occur. I actually wrote a blog post called Quantum Hacker Lab that talked a little bit about all these different attacks on quantum encryption systems, so I'll link that below. So these hardware requirements are going to make it really difficult to use quantum cryptography everywhere. And that means we'll probably still need these classical encryption algorithms that can stand up to quantum computing attacks. And this will likely still be used in the majority of devices. However, maybe we can create a global quantum key distribution network. We started doing that already, it's not actually a fantasy. There are even four companies offering commercial quantum key distribution systems. NASA has been doing research on this between Earth and low Earth orbit to communicate between satellites and the ground. DARPA and Los Alamos Laboratory have actually created small quantum networks. Also, the quantum experiments at Space Scale Mission made a quantum key distribution link between China and the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in Vienna, Austria. It's 4,700 miles long, and they made the first quantum secure video call. This mission wants to continue and make a global quantum network by 2030. But yeah, putting up satellites costs a lot more money than upgrading a classical encryption algorithm. So post-quantum and quantum cryptography are different, but they both have their place in actually securing data in the quantum future. I hope you liked examining post-quantum and quantum encryption with me, and understand a little more the differences between these two, and how we can secure our data in the future where a large quantum computer exists. If you did, please like this video and subscribe, because I'll be doing a lot more videos on quantum computing, coding, and super cool tech stuff.